The objective is that we are providing the technologies for the scientists in Europe for the next decade. A supercomputing is aggregation of systems that are working together to perform a single problem at the same time. All the employees of VSC that are using this technology are experts. All the users from Europe, from abroad as well. My role is not to instruct them on how to digitize, but how to perform, to cooperate better, and how to find the mechanisms for their science to perform. Once we have agreed on the system we are having, the most important part is to set up the facility and to install the system. You have to follow rules if the rules are correct. If not, you have to work to change rules. This is Ciarna TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Dr. Sergi Girona, who is the Operations Director and the CIO of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Thank you for uh, hosting us here today, Sergi. Welcome to BSA. Sergi has a PhD in computer science from the uh, University Politecnica de Catalunya, where he was first an assistant and professor uh, specialized in operating systems. For the last 15 years, he worked here in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center where he's now CIO Operations Director. Uh, and he's also involved in PRACE, which is the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe. Now, the Barcelona Computer Center, uh, Supercomputing Center, specialize in HPC, High Performance Computing. Uh, and they manage today the Marian Ostrom system that we see here behind us. We have a super uh, entourage here today, a super context here today. And that's one of the most powerful computers in Europe today. It's located in this beautiful Torre Girona Chapel with more than 500 staff and experts. They focus on computer science, life science, earth science, and then applications in science and engineering. So Sergi, thank you very much for uh, welcoming us here. We're quite impressed with the, uh, with the installation. Can you maybe first talk a little bit about the history of the center? Where does it come from and what is the, uh, what is the uh, operations today and, and how will it evolve in the future? So Barcelona Supercomputing Center was established 15 years ago. Okay. But this is not how HPC came to Catalonia and came to Spain. Uh -huh. So in the 80s, a group of people at the university started doing parallelism. Mm -hmm. How to use different processes at the same time to get a shorter time to solution. Okay. After a few years, they created the European Center for Parallelism in Barcelona. This okay. was 90s. Mm -hmm. Then this group evolved a bit and have a strong cooperation with IBM. We have this IBM Research Center established jointly with IBM. And in 2004, we have the opportunity to, to install here in Barcelona the first Mare Nostrum. Okay. So this is the fourth edition. So we fourth have fourth of oh, them. Yeah. So the first one was the fastest in Europe, the fourth in the world, and we installed the Mare Nostrum in the chapel. Okay. The chapel is in Torre Girona, but it's not my family. <laughs> it's a different family with the same family name. Okay. <laughs> because also the street is called Girona Street is also... The same family, not mine. So maybe some relation in the older periods, but not today. And so tell us today, on the fourth generation of Mare Nostrum, what is the typical use and how can people... Uh, who is using this and who owns this computer center? So Barcelona Supercomputing is a public consortium formed by the Spanish Ministry, the Catalan government uh -huh. and the Technical University of Catalonia. Okay. So this is provided for science, for open public research and development. Okay. So any user in Spain, in Europe, worldwide, can get access to the systems via a peer review system. So okay. they submit applications. The best applications can get access to the systems mm -hmm. free at the point of usage, yep. prepaid by the governments. Users are paying by the excellent science they are performing. Mm -hmm. And can you give a couple of examples of the, the nice programs that are running here uh, on these systems behind us? So HPC's technology, it's a new tool for any research. Mm -hmm. So I can give you examples on medicine, okay. on astrophysics, on civil engineer, on mechanics, on new materials. So last year we had the Nobel Prize worldwide on the discovery of new astronomy mechanisms. We had the Nobel Prize on a topic that has been developed here. So okay. on the research they performed here with the simulations, they were able to identify 
how the telescopes can focus on the universe uh -huh. to check whether the new uh, developments are happening in the past. You get discoveries on, on drugs for the treatment of, of cancer. Mm -hmm. You get discoveries on, on how to better fuel the, the airplanes or the cars to reduce the impact on pollution. Mm -hmm. You discover new materials to reduce the weight of the, of the cars, airplanes, test, while guaranteeing the, the capacity in case of accidents. So mm -hmm. those are the discoveries that people is doing these days. Those are very long-term research projects oh, yeah. that happens to be into the society, into the citizens yep. in 10, 15 years time. Okay. And can you explain us a little bit today, what is the capacity of the, of the system that we have here behind us? Yeah, supercomputing. Supercomputer is used for doing performing simulations. Performing simulation is these days uh, performing uh, mathematical algorithms. Mm -hmm. This is performing multiplications, adds, subtractions, divisions, yeah. and this is the number of operations per second you can perform. Yeah. So these systems can perform 11 petaflops. This is 11 times 10 to the 15 operations per second. Mm -hmm. Okay, all together. And this will allow to perform a simulation that 10 years ago, with our former systems, we need a full year to perform. Okay. And how many parallel systems do you have in the system now? <laughs> uh, a, a supercomputing is aggregation of systems that are working together to perform a single problem at the same time. Yep. So in this system today, we have 3,456 nodes. Mm -hmm. Every node is having 48 processors. Okay. So in total, we have 165,000 cores in the systems that are interlinked, interconnected with high-speed network mm -hmm. in high velocity that allows to perform a simulation in very short time. Okay. And when we visited just before this interview, your uh, center, we also talked about the electricity that is being uh, used here. So how much do you, how much do you pay on a yearly basis for electricity here? Uh, <laughs> this, this year we are paying about one million, one million and a half electricity bill. Okay. So a supercomputer, of course, is aggregation of nodes, is aggregation of system. Yep. Every one of these 3,400 nodes we have is using at maximum 450 watts. Okay. When you have thousands, then you get the total sum. And so we calculated this about five to 10,000 families yeah. worth of electricity that is being used here. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's quite amazing. Eh? So tell me a little bit about your, what's the future for the, uh, for the center? What are you working on uh, right now? So the objective is that we are providing the technologies for the scientists mm -hmm. in Europe for the, for the next decade. Okay. Okay. These new technologies are not only including HPC capacities by <laughs> intelligent, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we need to provide a system that is capable of providing capacities on simulations, but also on artificial intelligence, because this is the, the way the research in the future will perform. Artificial intelligence, I mean, in the interviews that we do with all our CIOs at the moment, it's like the number one topic that they're all uh, into. So let's talk a little bit more about Maya Nostrum. So um, what are the typical challenges that, that you face when you uh, build a system like this? So once we have agreed on the system we're having, the most important part is to set up the facility and to install the system. Mm -hmm. So a facility like this one, which is 160 square meters, it took us uh, six months to build, mm -hmm. design and building. Yep. We need to do that rapidly because at the time we decide the systems to the install, we, don't, we want to have the system up and running as soon as possible. Yep. This system, we also install in a month and a half. So we took 45 days from the first rack to came in to have the full system in production available to users. Okay. And all these technologies are the forefront of the, of the, of the vendors. Mm -hmm. So a number of technologies were coming from different vendors. They were provided here before general availability of the yeah. components. So who are the main vendors here? We have Intel, of course, we have IBM, I imagine, uh, Lenovo. Um. So we are a public institution. We are running public procurement. So we, we, one, one of the, the most important parts of our work is to define properly the tender, the procurement documents, yep. to identify what we need, what our users need, mm -hmm. and then the vendors are coming to us and providing any answer. So you can have IBM, Lenovo, Fujitsu, Intel, HP, Atos Bull. So you have all of them. In okay. this case, this technology was jointly provided by IBM, but it's coming with technology from Lenovo, mm -hmm. Intel, NVIDIA, and Fujitsu. Okay. And so what is the typical lifetime of a computer center like this? 
This is technology. <laughs> it's the same lifetime as a laptop. I also just a four, couple of years. Four, five years. years, four, five years, yeah. years. Oh, yeah. Why that? Because the new technology is capable of duplicating the speed of the simulations. Yep. It's less consuming. So you are able to perform the same analysis with less cost for the, for the yep. electricity. And what is the position, let's say, uh, of, of your center compared to other centers in Europe? We are the best. You're the best. We are the the best. fastest, the number one today? The? The number one today. In, in terms of global, yes. Okay. So uh, we, are, we are setting our comparisons with the best centers in Europe. Uh -huh. So I can name it. So you have in Germany, you have Julik, you have LSZ in, in Munich, you have uh, HLRS in Stuttgart, you have Cineca in Italy, you have uh, COA in France, you have uh, CSCS in Switzerland. But in capacities, we are not only providing services on supercomputing, but we're having this strong research that is doing the co-design of the system and the research that is, is very powerful compared to all of them, because they have a different kind of services. And how does Europe compare to the US and, and to China nowadays in HPC? Uh, it's coming from the European Union. It's union, it's not united. <laughs> so we are a number of member states mm -hmm. that are trying to work together for a common objective. Yep. And the difference is that we are, we are not having a single decision making. Mm -hmm. So in the US, they have a clear roadmap and path for HPC and to exascale since three, four, five years. Yep. In China, they set up the same one. Japan as well. Okay. Europe is a little behind. Okay. So we'll be there with the same capacities, but one or two years in delay. But we are on the, on the path. We are working on that. Okay. But you told me that today in the US, they have a supercomputing center that's like 20 times bigger or faster than, uh, than the, the faster than Europe. So, so we need to speed up to, to catch up to, uh, to the Americans. We need to speed up for the Americans, for the Chinese, and for the Japanese. All of them are having these plans that they are expecting to have systems larger than the Europeans ones in yeah. the very short term. But we have good plans huh, right now. Yeah. So this is really, I mean, this is a platform for science, for innovation, for research on European scale. Correct. Including the interest of, of, of the European Union and the participating states of the initiative called EuroHPC is to enable this new research and development to become part of the industry and on the, especially on the SMEs. Okay. So this is my Nostrum 4. So what are the plans for the future? Mario Nostrum 5. <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> okay. So anytime we start, start the operation of a system, mm -hmm. I, forget, tend, I tend to forget about it and I start working for the next one. Oh, yeah. First, on getting the budget. So we submit an application at the European Union uh -huh. to this program called UHPC. We submit this application jointly with Portugal, with Croatia, with Turkey, mm -hmm. supported by Ireland, and, and of course supported by this, this, the Spanish uh, government. Yeah. And this application was awarded uh, to be hosting one of the PREXA scale systems in 2021. So okay. it will be replaced in early 2021 by a system which is multiplying by 20 the capacities of this system. Okay. So in 21, all this will be replaced by a new system that's 20 times faster than what we see here today. It will be aggregated because it does not fit. It's not sufficient space. Ah, so okay. the, new, the new system, it having, it's, it's having a cost that is rising more than 150 million euros. Mm -hmm. okay? It will mean about 200 racks instead of the 56 that we can fit in this room. Okay. It will be... 12 megawatts electricity. So it's a total cost ownership of a period of five years of 220 million euros. Mm -hmm. So we will have an next building behind this chapel and they will be properly connected. Okay. But the chapel will still be used as well. Sure. Okay. That's guaranteed. Okay. It's our trademark. So tell me a little bit, what is your role then? Your role is to, to design this or is, is, is your role more technical or more political and organizational? Altogether. <laughs> All together. So I joined BSC in 2004 when it, the, the Centro Nacional de Supercomputación, so the National Facility for Supercomputing, was created. Uh -huh. And at that time, I was taking responsibility for being responsible for designing the facility, okay. for setting up the computer room, for hiring the people, for creating the sysadmin group, for creating the user support, for creating yeah. the facility management group. And from that time, 
anytime that we have to renew the facilities, to design the new components of the different subsystems that we are having, yep. I'm responsible of this. And as you grow up, you, you become more less technical, yep. more political, more managerial. Okay. So I'm taking these phases. So how are, how are your teams organized? What kind of, what are the different, different teams that you have here? So today I'm having three clearly separated groups. Mm -hmm. One for the facility management, taking care of electricity, of the air conditioning or the cooling of the system, fire detection and so on. Yep. This is quite a small group because we rely on contracts to, to companies for, for supporting doing their real maintenance. Then we have the user support group, who is taking care of the users. So the users call, I have a problem, I want to perform better my application, I want to optimize my application. So what does it mean optimize? Okay, instead of spending one hour, I want to spend half an hour. That means that I can do twice the, the, the analysis. Okay, this is user support. And then the system administration and networking and security. So the people that really touch in the system, that control, yep. keep it up and running 24 seven. Okay. But in total, it's a, it's a team of 500 people. That's quite a team. No, my, 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 my team really is, is, is 40 people. Okay. So this is the operations group. Okay. So okay. this is yeah. operations directorate. And BSC is in total 600 people. This is 650 already grow up. Okay. So this is people doing research on the different areas that is working with our group for using the system at any point ah, of time. Okay. They're more on the scientific side. And, Correct. And what kind of research do they do here then? Um, they are doing their research on computer architecture. Ah, on okay. the, on, so, so these 400 people is organizing four departments. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the building body here was the computer architecture people. It's, it's, it's the, my director, Matteo Valero, okay. who in the 80s was starting a group. I started working with him as an, a grant student when I was 20, 21. This, this group is able to build the system from scratch, from the chip, to the operating system, to the libraries, to the compilers, to the applications, to any level. Then for these people to be able to, to design the system properly, they need to, and this is the group in fact that I was, I was doing my PhD, okay? Then this group needs to interact with people performing applications. Eh? Then we have a group that is doing research on, on life sciences, on medicine, on personalized medicine, but not with labs, but with silicon labs. Yeah. So they are performing just daily simulation. This group is 100 people working on genome analysis, okay. natural language processing, uh -huh. okay? And try to improve the, the precision medicine. So natural language is very important because you need to understand what the doctor is writing on the prescription. Mm -hmm. All the history of, of, of humans are yeah. in writing. So you need to analyze all the papers. You need to analyze this information. Then we have a group on, on air sciences. These mm -hmm. people is doing daily simulations on the air quality okay. because you want to be sure whether you have to have traffic restrictions or not. Mm -hmm. You want to understand what's the climate in the future, what's the conditions that we have to change today for making sure that we are yep. performing a, a better earth in the, in the next futures. Mm -hmm. So do I understand it correctly? If you want to build a high performance computing system, you want to build an HPC, if you want to build a supercomputer center, it's not something that you can just order from a vendor. It's something that you design, that you architect, that that you something that you almost like invent, and then you uh, you source the components. Is that, is that the right right way to look at it? The, the vendors have, they have their ideas, uh -huh. but at the end we are we are giving service to users, so we need to identify the needs for the users. Okay. So we don't have a single user. We are serving all the community. Yep. So we cannot dis di di have discrepancies between different users. Mm -hmm. So we need to identify, okay, what kind of cores they need, what kind of memory, what is the networking, what is the file system, what are the speeds, what are the capacities on different components. Yep. So we have to define properly the components of the paella yep. and then set up the properly like paella. The paella. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, so your role as a CIO here, is, 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 I can imagine, very different than the, the role of a typical CIO yes. of a, in a bank or in a government. And, and uh, how would you compare that? So all, my, all the employees of VSC that are using this technology mm -hmm. are experts, high level experts. Yeah. So minimum degrees, PhD engineer. <laughs> okay. All of them having many 
many diplomas and many reputations, any, many visits, many awards, yeah. any place. All the users from Europe, from abroad as well. Yeah. So my role is not to instruct them on how to digitize, but how to perform, to cooperate better and how to find the mechanisms for their science to perform. Yeah. So it's trying to extract the maximum for the capacity of the system. Yeah. So you have a difficult user group because, I mean, they, they know a lot about what I want. They know exactly what they, they want. They imagine. know what they want and you have to leverage what they need, yeah. what they want and everyone's needs. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about you as a manager. You've been running the operations group and being the CIO here for, uh, for 15 years. What is, how would you describe your management style? The different teams that you described that you have, how do you, how do you manage them? I, I really trust in people. Mm -hmm. So I can say I've been able to identify key components of my group. They, have, they are my team leaders yep. and I rely on the responsibility I'm giving to them. And this is the way I, 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 I perform my work. So I'm managing only a small group yep. and they outperform the people they have under, under their control. Mm -hmm. So you run a very specialized operation here. So how easy is it for you to find the right people? Because your team must be super experts in, in, in the networking and, and, and computing and operations and so on. How easy is it for you to find your people? No, that's not the proper question. It's very difficult. Difficult. Yeah. It's absolutely complicated. Uh -huh. And, and we, are, we are very close to university. We have mm -hmm. very strong corporations and we have special programs to train people and specific skills on SPC. Mm -hmm. But once the people are trained, they are living any place worldwide. <laughs> okay. So we have a group of ex BSC employees that are working every place worldwide. Okay. CERN, Oracle, any place. You can get them, you list them. They get skills, some people stay, some people leave. Okay. So. Okay, that's also opportunities. We need to identify good people. We train some, some, some stay, some other leaves. Okay. So you recruit mostly from, from campus, young uh, people that come from university? No. No? Globally. So we try to do this because this is easy, because yeah. this is, they, they can start working here part-time, they are skilled and they, they, of course, want to be here at BSC with the yeah. reputation BSC is coming. They, 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 they really love to come here, but in my department and globally at BSC, we have number of people worldwide. So at BSC, we have 47 different uh, citizenships. Okay. So we have so people really from an international abroad. team. Absolutely. Okay. So attracting people is not easy. Yeah. So how easy is it to to motivate your people, to grow them, to, That's to the easy part. develop them as professionals? That's the easy part because they have the system. Uh -huh. You cannot get these facilities any place in the world. Yep. So in Europe, you have three, four of them. Yep. Worldwide, you have 20. So they, they keep motivated themselves. Okay. So if they want to work at the very high level, yep. they want to stay here. So, so this is the best computer toys that you can have. I mean, if, if that's your passion, then there's worldwide. no better place to be. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You ha and, and you have they say five places in Europe, 20 in the world. Mm -hmm. One in Barcelona, and if you are Spanish living here, that's better. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a bit about your leadership style. So we talked about your management style is giving people trust and, and, uh, and attracting uh, experts. And, um, but leadership is different. I mean, if you're in this role for 15 years, um, you must be a really good leader. So. And a good way to ask this is, what do you think people say about you when you're not around? How would people talk about you? <laughs> Badly. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the point is, I, I'm very strong on decisions and commitments. Okay. Okay. This is the way you can create trust from other people. So that means that I, I, when we schedule a plan, we have to follow. Okay. Uh, we have to observe. I can accept any deviations. I can do whatever, but it has to be rational and, and accepted. So people can say that I am severe. I'm following directions, but I'm okay. 
I, I think it's a place to go for an engineering part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is always interesting is when we want to know more about you as a person is, uh, is, is what is your personality type? So we asked you to do the uh, MBTI test, not necessarily very scientifically, you don't need a supercomputer to compute it, no. <laughs> just an online test. But it's a good way to, to, um, uh, to learn about you a little bit more. And you did the test and you are a defender, which is the ISFJ. And I is mit, uh, a bit more introvert, S sensing, F feeling, and J for judging. Um, and people with this profile, their strengths typically are that they are supportive, that they are reliable and patient, that they are imaginative, observant, enthusiastic, loyal and hardworking, and they have good practical skills. Does that resonate with you? Enthusiastic it is, yeah. Okay. Now on the weaknesses side, let's say, not necessarily you, but people with this profile, they can be sometimes too humble and too shy. They can take things personally. Uh, they can overload themselves with work, uh, sometimes too altruistic and uh, reluctant to change. Which one of these um, uh, resonates with you and how do you overcome this? Because you, you need to change, because you need to change every four or five years, for instance. Or... So overloading, reluctant changes. So this is something that it, it's, it's hard for me on, on, on accepting. Uh -huh. So overloading, it's always the, a matter of saying, okay, I can do, I can do, I can do. Okay. And being enthusiastic on the work, it's, it's the opposite. So it's, it's very difficult to, to shift obligations to other, to, 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 to transmute this to another person. And changes, okay, if things are performing well, why to change that? But you need to do that, yeah? So is it difficult for you to say no? No, no, my typical answer is always no. Oh, yeah. Then you are positive afterwards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm, it's, it's, it's difficult, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I ha they have to give me a good reason for, for saying no. But once, once it's no, it's no. Okay. And so overloading, taking on a lot of work, you, you work a lot. Do you, are you a workaholic? No. no. I try to avoid that. Okay. okay. I try to keep my weekends for me, uh -huh. for doing my sailing, okay. to have my rest, family, and try to get easy. When it's possible, I try to keep that very yep. preserved. Uh, on working days, I'm okay. On traveling, I'm okay. On meetings, extensive, no problem. Because yep. you travel a lot. We travel a lot. We are working, we are building the European case for the HPC and we uh -huh. have to communicate with all the European stakeholders in Belgium, in Finland, in Italy, in uh -huh. Germany, in Dublin, any place worldwide. And you have a family as well and children? Yeah. So what are the values that you want to pass on to your children? I have twins. I'm yep. doing everything in parallel, you know? <laughs> so my twins are already engineers. Uh -huh. So... I think that they, I have promoted them for being serious, for follow rules, and for enjoy life. So you have to be reliable. You have to give trust to people. Mm -hmm. They have to trust you. You have to follow rules. Yeah. If the rules are correct, if not, you have to work to change rules. Yeah. And who are the people that you look up to? Are they like examples in your life? Mentors that you learned a lot from? Mm. On life and personal, my mother. Uh -huh. So I was, I was uh, orphan for father since I was 12. Okay. So she took over the family, carrying all, all the problems. It's not easy for a woman. Uh, it's 40 years ago, uh -huh. so it's a long while. And that's for, for family and um, for, uh, for work. It's for example, Matteo Valero, my director, uh -huh. pushing since he was just a PhD or professor at the telecom school. Uh -huh. And he's now running this supercomputing center for many years with, with strong capacities. And what did you learn from your mother? What are the things that you say, this is really what I took from her? Intensive working. Hard work. Hard work. Um, relaxed home. 
be happy at home, although the problems are outside, outdoors, any place. Mm -hmm. So you have take take life easy, take it easy. You have to keep it running. Okay. So my favorite question in these conversations is: um, You have a very successful career, but I'm sure you've made some brilliant failures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was your most brilliant failure that you ever did, and what did you learn from it? The failure was being too optimistic on, on, on resiliency of systems. Okay. So this is a system for science. Uh -huh. So this is not running under UPS, under diesel. So oh, in no. case of failure, it's failing. Oh, yeah, okay. Because if but a nobody scientist dies. Is yeah. nobody dies. Yeah. But in terms of, for example, of storage, the storage can also fail. Mm -hmm. But in case of failing, if you don't have many, many copies, you have to rebuild experiments, ah, yeah. and that's bad. Okay. Because you need to rebuild what you have accounted for in the past. Mm -hmm. So you cannot be that optimistic on the planning. Although it's, it's, it's science, you have to be serious keeping all the information necessary to rebuild the case. So your learning was that you need to plan for failure and have redundancy and redundancy and... Um... Yeah, but not that many redundancies, because <laughs> they are costly. Uh, it's so too expensive. That, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, you have to stop at one level. Okay. So, Sergio, when are you happy here in your work? So I'm happy because I'm giving service to scientists. Uh -huh. Scientists are performing research. Research objective is uh -huh. citizens, society. So they are trying to improve how we are living mm -hmm. and how we can understand our future and our way of living. So my day life working is to provide services to these people so yeah. better citizens better society so i'm happy with and it's it's important for you that you have the feeling that you contribute to uh to the community is that an important driver for you uh, for you in your job yeah this is quite important so that's the reason of living here mm -hmm. on, on on this world so helping others performing living together I'm not running competition daily, so we have to cooperate. Okay. So people that are watching this uh, video, uh, several under them are ambitious future digital leaders that would like to have a job like yours. Uh, what would you advise them? What is the learnings that you have taken over the last 15 years? What would you advise your younger self of 10, 15 years ago? What helps people to become successful in this, uh, in this technical world? Uh, it's not only in the technical and the digital work. Mm -hmm. Hardworking, serious, and communicate to others. Mm -hmm. Don't keep your things on you. Express your opinions. Most of them are valid. Most of them are super valid. Some of them are not. Mm -hmm. But all, any of them are providing value to the others that are listening to you. Okay. So, Sergi, last question. What is your personal mantra? Uh, what I'm usually telling to my sons, take it easy. Okay. Anything is coming a solution. Mm -hmm. Analyze, solve it, take it easy. Okay. And with that, I would like to thank you for uh, your hospitality and for your time and for your wisdom uh, of this uh, conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.